Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Oh, I heard you, some of you, but I didn't hear all of you, but that's good. I'm glad that you're here. I, I want to share some things with you this morning. Uh, again, I'm going to allow the Spirit to lead me. I may not follow the notes that I passed out, but I'd like for you to read them anyway. If I don't follow them, don't get it done with them. And uh, if you have any suggestions, I would appreciate your comments. But most of you know by now, if you don't know by now, you're going to hurt right now, that last Sunday afternoon I was in an automobile accident. Uh, as my custom normal is on Sunday morning after worship, I get in the car and I usually let my kids know that I'm going to the cemetery to be able to see my wife and to visit with her and to pay respects to her, to honor her. Uh, it's something I've done almost every Sunday since she's passed away, except when the roads are bad or something's going on here at the church or something in that order. But I got behind a car, and that car was driving sporadically. So I pulled way back. I gave that person plenty of room in order to be able to manipulate. There were times he would pull off or she would pull off, and the driver would pull off, whatever to the shoulder road and go 40 to 45 miles an hour on the shoulder and then come back onto the main road. So I wasn't sure exactly what was going on with that car. So when that car got up to the Fairwood East turn off where the medical center is, the Fairwood East Hospital School, it made a right hand turn and almost stopped as it was going around the main. And there was a car waiting at the stop sign to get out on the main road. So the, that car was turning and getting off the road. I was slowing up quite a bit. I, I told the state trooper I was only going about 30 miles an hour. I probably was going slower. And as I was slowing down to let that car pass, she started to pull out right in front of me and stopped right in the middle of my lane. <coughs> Fortunately, she only gave me 20 feet to stop or so. And I had already had my foot in the brake and I stayed it on and had to pull off to the left a little bit. And our front hands met. If you go out and look at Steve's van, you will see that the left front headlight, the fender, and the bumper is all broken. And uh, her car, boy, you, you should see the other guy <laughs> uh, that type of situation. I was afraid I was going to broadside her. That's why I pulled over to the left as far as I could. But there was just no way of missing her. It was her fault. Uh, you ask Alice back there, she'll tell you I'm a good driver. <laughs> and the thing that bothered me, and uh, Steve must have sensed this, I felt sorry for her. I felt sorry for her. Uh, here she was, a young teenager, maybe 18, 19 years of age, maybe a little bit older, I'm not sure, I didn't check. She had just bought the car four weeks before, brand new Nissan. It was our first accident. And I really, really had compassion and understanding for her. Steve must have sensed it. How many times did you tell me, Steve, now, Dad, don't be a good guy? <laughs> Uh, I, if, he, if he said it once, he said it several times. And the reason I tell that is the fact that on Tuesday, I believe it was, I got a packet from a lawyer up in Columbus. On Wednesday, I got four or five more packages from lawyers all over the state of Ohio who wanted me to call them to investigate the possibility of suing the other driver for personal injury, for uh, uh, other things in this order, and really wanted me to exploit what had happened. I, I got thinking about that. And I, I've heard about ambulance uh, chases all my life, and that's exactly the way I thought. And I was repulsed by as many different companies, lawyer, legal companies, they were contacting me, trying to get me to become a client of theirs, that they can pursue and get money for me. 
but it's really getting money for them. Now I got to think. I, I kind of appreciate not not the fact that they're ambulance chasers, but I kind of appreciate the innovation, the aggressiveness that they were exercising, trying to find clientele for their industry. And the more I thought about that, the more I began to think about the church. And with the condition of the world that we are now in, that we as Christian people, as the church, the body of Jesus Christ, need to exercise more innovation, more aggressiveness, more of a passion to be able to bring people off the street into the kingdom of God. We sit back and we wonder what in the world is happening. And I think one of the problems that we have in the world today is a complacency that we find in many congregations about my seeking the lost. And we're trying to bring people to Christ. I think all this thinking that I've had done about the aggressiveness and the innovation relating to the church has come about because of the uh, prayer meeting group decided that we were going to pray for an increase by the end of the year of at least one person that will kind of be a committed person to the work of the church. Several years ago, back in the 60s, I spent a little bit of time with my brother in the work of the Goody Chapel. Uh, he asked me to drive a kind of come up and work with him, and I did. I lived in the house with him, and we had one bedroom for the four of us, uh, she, Mary Alice, and Pierre and I. And I, I, I accepted secular work. I was selling insurance through different companies in order to be able to make a living. And I helped with the church as much as I could with what I was doing to make a living. And one of the things that the Gilead Chapel did during that particular time, and they probably still do it, but it's no longer the Gilead Chapel, they probably, uh, it was the idea that they would go into a community and they would survey that community going door to door to door, canvas the whole area. Sometimes it would take three to four weeks to be able to complete that survey. And one of the things that really impressed me as far as what they were doing was that the comment was made that if we find one person that would be receptive to the gospel of Jesus Christ, and we can teach them and bring them into the kingdom, then we have had success. One person in four weeks was their goal. There are several thriving churches on Long Island, on Staten Island, in New York City, as a result of the surveys that they would make in which they were looking for that one person. Several years ago, I was praying, this is a confession almost, I was preaching in a church in Titusville, Pennsylvania. And by the way, that's where Ruth was born. And as I was preaching in this particular church in Titusville, Pennsylvania, uh, I made contact with a family that I was trying to get to come to church. And Ray Turk, one of the leaders of the church, and I were sent at the door greeting people, and here came this family. And after I had invited them to church, I learned a few things about them that I wasn't very, very pleased with. So Ray said, who are they? After they went in and sat down. I explained the situation, the circumstances, some of the things that bothered me about the family. And I made a comment that I said, I'm really not excited about their coming to church here. Now, that, I was a young at that time. 
I want to realize that this is youth coming down on me. Ray took my arm and says, come with me. And we walked off in the Sunday school room. He says, I don't want to ever hear you say that again. He said, if a person has a soul, they are welcome here and we want to teach them. Thank God for Ray Turk. You begin to examine the scriptures and you will find that over and over and over again, there is an emphasis being made about the souls that are lost and die in the world needing Jesus Christ. Many of the parables that Jesus told were told for the purpose in mind of reaching out into the community. I have one in our notes, Matthew, the 22nd chapter, verses 2 through 14. I'm not going to read the whole thing because it's too long. And I would challenge you to go home and read it yourself and read the other uh, versions of this in Mark and Luke. If there was a king that was making a marriage for his son and bidding all his friends and all his uh, acquaintances, acquaintances, and not one of them would come. And the king was angry. And he called his servants and told them to, to go out on the highways and the byways and bring them to, to, the, uh, to the wedding feast. And the tenth of verse of that particular chapter, Matthew 22, says those servants went out in the highways and gathered together all as many as they found, both bad and good, and the wedding was furnished with guests. I want you to see that. The king, who represents God, told his servants, represents us, to go out in the highways and the byways and gather all that we can find to bring them into the kingdom of God. Another series of passages of scriptures that come to my mind is that found in the Luke the 15th chapter. In Luke the 15th chapter, we find three parables that Jesus told in relationship to the uh, the uh, uh, lost and dying. The very first parable that he tells is the idea of the, uh, the shepherd that had a hundred sheep. And ninety-nine were in the fold and one was missing. You all know what happened. The shepherd went out to find the sheep that was lost, who was lost because of his own volition, because that's the way the sheep are. They'll be spread apart. They don't have a shepherd. They'll go abroad. And he carried that sheep back in the fold and called all his friends together with the idea that they would rejoice over that one lost sheep that was found. And I want you to notice the seventh verse of the 15th chapter. I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over ninety and nine just persons which really need no repentance. The joy of winning a soul. The joy that would be in heaven over one sinner that repents and comes to Jesus. The second parable is, is somewhat uh, similar. A woman had a uh, garment or a piece of jewelry that had ten coins on it. And by the way, that ten coins is usually a wedding gift that was given to, uh, to the bride of a man and the ten coins represented their his idea that she was a ten. Maybe that's a little bit exaggerated because I didn't have not used that expression back then. That if she would have be unfaithful in her marriage, the husband would take one coin off that. And that would be an announcement to the community that she was an adulteress. So it's highly important when she lost that one coin for her to find. And what did she do? She swept the house until that coin was found. She corrected the mistake that she made by having a dirty house. Because when she found it, she called all her friends. I want you to notice what verse 10 says. I'm sorry. Wrong chapter. Verse number 10. Likewise, I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. Now, I, I want you to notice something there. It's not the angels that are rejoicing. It's not the angels that are rejoicing. The joy is in the presence of the angels. 
And the only ones that I can see that would be rejoicing in the presence of the angel is God the Father, and God the Son, and God the Spirit. I say to you that God is not willing that any should perish, that all should come under the knowledge of the truth. There is a need for us to have a passion for souls that we can bring joy in the presence of the angels over those sinners that repent. The third parable is the parable of the prodigal son. And as you remember that parable, the prodigal son asked for his inheritance and went out and wasted it and began feeding the hogs and would have eaten, if he could, the food that he was feeding to the hogs. That's how he went down it. Finally, he decided he was going to go home. And when the father coming in, the father standing by the window waiting, just waiting. And the father saw him coming, he went out and greeted him, threw a great big feast for him, and rejoiced over the fact that this, my son who was lost, has come home to be found again. What happened to the older brother? The older brother complained. The older brother complained and said, Oh, I've been with you all my life. I've been faithful. And look, you throw a feast for your son that did all the wasting of your substance. He says, You never threw me a feast. You never killed a fat cat for me. And the father said, Rejoice. All that I have is yours. Now you rejoice that your sub brother has come home. And that was the lesson that Jesus wanted to give. We rejoice over those that come to Jesus Christ. I might say that down through the years, oftentimes when I have had problems within, not problems with when we were trying to develop leadership within the church, and I'm thinking of one man, two men in particular. Who, when we sat down by one of the new members that had come to the church during my ministry, we began to evaluate their, their leadership ability. Some of the men had great leadership ability. And I can remember this one man, his name was Oscar. I'm not going to go any further than that. Since I knew his reward. But this one man says, I don't want him in leadership in this church. And I asked him why. He says, because if he becomes a leader, I'm going to lose my prestige in this congregation. I want you to think. Eventually, because that man would not be, could not be used because of the a barrier that was put up by the leadership of the church that already existed, he went back to the church where he was before the leadership up there. Brother, we need to be open. We need to be receptive. We need to be looking for individuals that we can bring to Jesus Christ. As I said, I'm not going to have time to go through everything I have in my notes here. But I would like for you to read it. Let me give you another illustration of something that happened. I'm not sure of the year, but it was July the 4th morning. I, 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 I was sleeping in my bed and the phone rang. That was before the days of cell phone, believe it or not. That did, those days did exist. And as the phone rang, I heard and recognized the voice of the other man of the line was Jeff, Jeff Holmes. The fellow who ran one of the shoe stores in Quarter, Kentucky. His in laws came to church, Otis and Sue Brown. And he said, Phil, Otis is missing. We don't know where he is. Otis was a man that had all times made a dementia. I'm not quite sure what it would be. But he was in a nursing home. And somehow he was able to escape the security of that nursing home. He turned out to missing. So I got up real quick and got myself cleaned up and went up to the house to be able to see what I could do. And we got busy and we started looking for Otis. Otis was missing for five to six weeks. Nobody knew where he was. A man who needed medication. 
And it was obvious that he had help in his, quote, escape from the nursery. During that five to six weeks that he was missing, organizations in the Corbin area, such as the Boy Scouts and the Girl Scouts and Kiwanis, other organizations, I can't remember them all, churches who were not even associated with them, formed how to search groups, and they would search the entire area in order to be able to find clothes. People would get off from work and spend the rest of the evening going out and riding right the roads trying to find Otis. And the Otis Brown story became quite popular in the newspapers. Eventually he was found laying in the pasture that had been searched many, many, many times. It appeared that one of the cows of that pasture evidently stepped on the back of his neck and broke his neck. And we have no idea how we ever got there. But the thing that impressed me was the fact that an entire town of almost 10,000 people had one thought in mind, was to find others. I want you to look around this morning. I want you to see the empty seats that we have here. I want you to think about the people that you know that you could invite to come fill these empty seats. And may you have a real passion to win that soul to Jesus Christ as we found that entire city of Corbin, Kentucky trying to find a lost man by the name of Otis. Otis was a good Christian. Even though he was later in years quite confused because of the disease he had. It was an easy funeral to preach. Even though my wife had been threatened if I preached the Senate service. There is a course that is sung. And I want to impress this course upon your mind. I look for the hymn book so I can find it. But I'm sure that many of you have heard it. Many of you may have sung it. It goes something like this. Lord, lay some soul upon my heart. And love that soul through me. And may I nobly do my part to win that soul for thee. Let me repeat. Lord, lay some soul upon my heart and love that soul through me. And may I nobly do my part to win that soul with thee. I hope this morning I have impressed upon you a great need to reach out and bring a soul to Jesus Christ. Before we have an invitation, I'm so thankful. Father in heaven, we thank you for the saving power of Jesus Christ. We realize our Father that no other name has ever been given whereby we must be saved. Our Father, help us as a congregation. Help us as a person that we might be able to reach out and win souls for your glory, to your honor, and for your kingdom. For this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to be singing our invitation. Hymn number 62, Just As I Am. If there's any here that needs to make a decision for Christ, we invite you to come.